This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Cold weather sparks concerns about Mecklenburg County's response to helping the homeless, plus lots of questions about the future of the Carolina Panthers. And is gentrification to blame for low bus ridership across Charlotte? Those topics and more next on Off the Record. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Jeff Rivenbark and welcome to Off the Record. In the next half hour, we'll take a look at this week's top headlines. But first, I'd like to introduce this week's guest, John Paul Gallus with COT Biz, Nick Oxner with WBTV News 3, uh, Mark Garrison with WBT Radio, and Kirsten Garris with Spectrum News. So good to have you all here and Happy New Year. Good to be here. Man, it has been extremely cold, and without a doubt, the big story this week was the weather. It brought sleet, snow, and freezing rain to portions of the state, and extremely cold temperatures across the Charlotte region. Hopefully, you're warm and cozy tonight, but for many of our homeless neighbors, that isn't the case. Earlier this week, Mecklenburg County Commissioner Pat Cotham was critical of the county for not opening warming shelters during the frigid temperatures. So what do you think the county's response should be when the weather dips this cold as it's been this week? Well, the county's response has been that they have been talking to their community partners, people like the Men's Shelter of Charlotte, the Salvation Army, and they said those shelters have enough capacity. They have more resources. They've also extended their hours. So shelters who are normally only open at night, they're open during the day too. So the county's response has been, hey, our community partners have enough you know, space. We're going to hold off for now because their stance is this is a emergency shelter. This is when everyone else is full to capacity. That's when they open their shelter. But obviously, Pat Cotham wasn't happy about that. And she's been out almost every night passing out hand warmers. She's been passing out sandwiches to people saying, hey, you know, yes, we have these shelters open, but not everyone wants to go to a shelter or can go to a shelter. So she's doing her best to make sure people stay warm. When I woke up this morning, the wind chill was three degrees on my weather app this morning. That sounds like an emergency to me. And I think <laughs> the state stance that you've heard from the county and the city leaders on, on why they're not opening emergency shelters has seemed a little tone deaf when we know there are still people out on the streets. When you look at the standards that the counties established for opening county facilities, you begin to discover that they've set a restriction for there to be a, a 10 degree level for a 24 hour period of time in advance of opening those shelters. Uh, we ought to look at what other cities are doing. In the city of New York, for instance, uh, they, they uh, are looking for a 32 degree experience for an extended period of time. That's freezing. Anything that's freezing ought to be an emergency where the buildings are open. And I know Kirsten touched on this earlier. You know, clearly there are some homeless people that may not go to a shelter no matter how many are open or how many beds are sure. available. That's just a reality. But uh, you mentioned something earlier, Nick, yeah. about the homeless people that have pets. Uh, that's yeah. something I hadn't thought well, and about. Well, think about, yeah, the, no, most homeless shelters, if any, allow pets. There are homeless folks who have pets in the city. My wife just did a story with one who has a dog, can't get in. So if you're going to separate me from my dog, yeah, I'm not going to go to a homeless shelter. There are others that separate families, mm -hmm. men's shelters and women's shelters. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of restrictions. It's not as simple as you and I might think about it because we've never had to experience that. But I think simply saying we have the bed capacity and so we're not we're good is is doesn't look at the whole totality no, because it's a very complex issue because every homeless story has a backstory mm -hmm. with it that is very difficult and 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 the other interesting thing is that uh, you were talking about pat handing out hand warmers you do have homeless people who they're scared to go to the shelters mm -hmm. in some cases. They don't want to be around some of the other people who are there. They'd rather try to stay warm under a bridge, which is a fascinating thing to think about. But I agree. I mean, clearly, what would it hurt to go ahead and open the bed space I agree. and well, make it available? What's interesting is I've reached out to other counties because I wanted to know, are we alone in this? Cabarrus County, Iredell County, and Gaston County, they're all doing the same thing. They're relying on the nonprofit sector for now to kind of open up this bed capacity, but they are watching the weather. So it is, I think this, it's a complicated issue. It's like, do you open it, do you not? Because if there is space, some folks in government will say, well, if we don't need to open it just yet, why open it? Mm -hmm. Good and news is supposed to be back in the 50s next week. So. But there mm -hmm. is a <laughs> comprehensive strategy dealing with the homeless in Mecklenburg County, and we want to give credit to those organizations that are trying to accomplish that. Uh, but I think at this time of year, it's, it's beyond uh, mm -hmm. anybody's expectation to live out in the cold. Well, in December, Carolina Panthers team founder and owner Jerry Richardson announced plans to sell the team at the end of the season. Charlotte businessman 
Felix Sabatis is heading their group to purchase the team, but he says Bank of America Stadium needs to be replaced with a domed venue. And lots of folks are wondering, you know, who will be the team's new owners and will they keep the team in Charlotte? Will they move it across the state line? I mean, there's no guarantees and a lot of people are concerned about what's going to happen to the Panthers. Even before the current stadium was built, they were looking at locations around Mecklenburg County as well as inside the county. So there are going to be uh, some other uh, expectations of considerations beyond our own uh, uh, center city uh, venue. Um, well, I think taxpayers need to grab their wallets because <laughs> Felix Sabatis is all, already saying uh, governments have got to step up and help us pay uh, uh, for a new stadium. So uh, that's going to be a big debate. How much do local taxpayers want to pony up? How much should they pony up? Um, and uh, I, I think that's going to be the big issue. I here. think it's also probably important for us as we couch this, this discussion around what Felix Sabatis has said. So there are a number of other people who are going to make bids. Mm -hmm. And although Felix has done a very good job very early making the most noise mm -hmm. on this issue, um, I think we're far, far too early in the process to know what's going to Let, actually Let's happen. remember that the Panthers are the Carolina Panthers, not the Charlotte Panthers. So that gives them even more freedom to mm -hmm. move around the region. Mm -hmm. exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the PSLs. Now, um, there are permanent seat licenses. And when the stadium was built, the original agreement reads, and I want to read this to you, a licensee has the right and obligation to purchase the related season tickets for all home games for the franchise as long as the team plays in the stadium. A lot of folks who have those PSLs are concerned if a new stadium is built five, ten years down the road or whatever, they may have to start all over from scratch, right? Well, of course, and that makes sense. I mean, what you just read said, if we're playing in this stadium. I, I'm not sure why PSL owners would be whining. Yeah. Uh, they know what they signed. Yeah, that's absolutely. They bought that seat, yeah. the license to that seat. <laughs> in well, this that, stadium. Yeah, that's that's right. that seat's not going anywhere. I do hope that, I think the PSL model was an interesting way to mm -hmm. help finance mm -hmm. and fund the construction of that stadium. It made a lot of sense, and I hope they look to something like that again, and maybe that could defray some of the need for tax dollars. Absolutely. Yeah. But it is worth noting, the city will use probably some of their tourism dollars, mm -hmm. which are restricted, but again, if we're trying to build a dome, it's going to cost a lot more a than lot what we money. have in that account. So they will have to be creative about mm -hmm. how do you fund a new stadium. And when you want to fill those seats, you're going to look to the current seat yeah. owners as the best audience to go after mm -hmm. to sell mm -hmm. those seats. Exactly. And you <laughs> noted that 90% of those seats are filled by PSL owners. So, I mean, right. that's a big deal. I mean, that's 90% of that big stadium. I would bet they get the first opportunity to buy a seat yeah. in yeah. the next At day. least, I'd hope it so. It just makes good business sense, <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. Exactly. Well, let's also talk a little bit, too. You know, when Bank of America Stadium was built many years ago, um, you know, there's more real estate available in the center city area. Uh, mm -hmm. Not so much so now. So that's why there's a possibility, as we said earlier, it could go across the state line, Gaston County. Um, many other NFL teams had their uh, stadium, you know, 30 minutes away from their core city. So uh, that could be something that we have to deal with in the future, right? I watched the city of Detroit uh, move out uh, outside Detroit City for their uh, Silver Dome at one point in time, and and they've uh, discovered that they really want it back in the center city. That's the the kind of draw they're looking for. The same kind of thing is going to happen here. You'll. We'll, we'll look at those surrounding communities, but I'll bet the Center City uh, businesses will be uh, most more focused on keeping it work. Didn't somewhere. we already do that with the basketball arena? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We like to have our sports in uptown. So. <laughs> well, it might be good for that new stadium to be a little more versatile than just an yeah. NFL stadium. Exactly. Um, there are lots of reasons. We'd like to hold some big concerts here in town or maybe some soccer games uh, in the Center mm -hmm. City that would be uh, valuable to us. Well, in North Carolina, the class size for kindergarten through third grade classes can have up to 24 students, but a new law that takes effect for the 2018-2019 school year reduces the number of students in those classrooms to 18 students for kindergarten, 16 students for first grade, and 17 students for second and third grades. It's all aimed at trying to give students a solid start and more interaction with teachers in those early grades, but Charlotte Mecklenburg schools are kind of shaking in their uh, boots right now. I mean, they've got to come up with 20 million dollars for the next fiscal year to pay for additional classrooms and mobile units and to shuffle around those teachers and there's been talk about pulling some of the teachers from the secondary schools in order to uh, fulfill the cap sizes that are going to be implemented with this new law I mean w what are your thoughts I mean about Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and how they're going to handle and deal with this 
Well, I'm not surprised that they're uh, that they're concerned about the money on this. I'm not so sure they couldn't pull it off with some with a little creative thinking. But I, there's a we were chatting earlier. There's a short session of the legislature coming up. They may come up with some more money to I, help. I would be shocked if that doesn't happen. Um, I think. This was the legislature passing a bill that they intended to have positive ramifications and were maybe a little short-sighted on, on what, because it's not just Charlotte Mecklenburg that's impacted that's by right. it. I mean, it's yeah. every school district really Wake across County. the state. Yeah. And, and so I think once this bill passed, lawmakers have been hearing from school leaders in big and small districts all across North Carolina, hey, 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 this is a little more big of a burden than you might think. And so I think we'll see a, a legislative fix in the short session. A WFAE reporter this week, they quoted a superintendent Wilcox, he said, I need to find almost 450 teachers next year that I don't currently have in the system. So my sense will be that we'll have to reassign some teachers at the secondary level and we'll let middle school and high school class sizes swell. We're already in some algebra classes, 40 to one. That's staggering. That's amazing to know mm -hmm. that there are 40 students already in some of these classrooms. I'm not sure I had a college class that big. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, CMS was already dealing with overcrowding and with a teacher shortage before this law, you know, kicks in. So it is something that the legislator has to look at because, again, all these schools are dealing with similar issues. Not enough teachers, a lot of students, and kids are learning in mobile units outside, you know, instead of in a classroom right now. So this, that is something to think about. This is also the result of our legislative uh, problems in Raleigh. Uh, there are a number of rural communities that want more dollars moving in that direction. And the only place they can get that money is to take it from urban school districts. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to face up to that problem and somewhere think more creatively than we have so But I, far. I think this is a unique thing that the legislature has done because they've managed to Most put sure. everyone at a disadvantage, both rural, urban, and suburban districts here. But the pressure is to eliminate yeah. some of the other positions so that those slots yeah. are funded yeah. the way they've funded them. So I want to talk a little bit about this bill could also force the redrawing of school districts. And there's been a lot of talk in Matthews and Men Hill about, you know, the possibility of getting in a charter school and getting funding through the state for that. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it's going to happen. Mark disagrees with me. Well, I, I think it's possible that it can happen. It's already passed the House. The Senate uh, has some... Um has some questions about it. The, the idea that we're talking about here is allowing a municipality like Matthews to operate a charter school that in essence is in competition with CMS. What I think is the bigger story that often gets overlooked here is how much dissatisfaction there is in towns mm -hmm. like Matthews and Mint Hill with CMS. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely fed up. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a longtime mayor in Matthews who put this study committee together and their first recommendation was disband CMS and come up with smaller school districts, mm -hmm. and they they knew that would never fly. So there is a lot of dissatisfaction with I, Charlotte Mecklenburg. School. I agree with that. I think you saw a very hard push. It passed the House because of a lot of moving and pleading really from right. State Representative Bill Brawley, who represents that area, and the legislature senior well-respected member of the State House. There is not an appetite in the State Senate to, to, to allow this measure to go through. There wasn't at the end of last session. I'll be surprised if that changes this session. It is interesting with this new law. Uh, I read something this week that uh, a school in Matthews would need 13 new mobile units, basically a trailer. Well, there's an ordinance in Matthews, you can't have trailers. So they're facing a situation in order to, um, you know, if for CMS to fulfill what they have to do with this new law, how do they do that when the ordinance in the town says no trailers, no mobile units? I think they'd find a way to accommodate those trailers mm -hmm. if they could get their charter school. Um, <laughs> I don't doubt that. Um, you know, I, this is a, a rebellion against public schools. And uh, people want choice. Uh, they don't want to be steered uh, the way Charlotte Mecklenburg schools want to steer them. Another big story this week on Wednesday, Mecklenburg County Manager Dina Dioria updated commissioners about the cyber attack which hacked county computers in early December. She said most services would be back online by the end of the week and that county staff are beefing up cyber security measures and increasing employee training. Now it's been a month since the cyber attack happened. Uh, what grade would you give the county and how they handled the cyber attack. <laughs> I, I give it an F. This one. <laughs> I give it an F, and now I disagree with this guy next to me here. Um, look, I think I give it an F, uh, the county an F on this. First, because their initial response to the attacks and saying, oh, we'll probably pay the ransom and, and setting this 
this image in the public of, of the limited scope of the problem, the limited cost that the ransom would be. Um, and they said, well, just it'll go away. And I think they tried to downplay the risk a little bit. And that was really misleading. And then they we reported that the scale of the attack was a little bit lo much larger than they had said. And they realized that it was. And they did some things. And they said, oh, you know what? We're not going to pay this ransom. And But then they said, but we'll have all of our systems back online within a week or two. Yeah, well, right. you know, that was about a month ago. And not everything's <laughs> back online yet. And so we've consistently seen bad messaging, misleading messaging, maybe just incorrect messaging that was based on good intentions in some instances. But bottom line, we've not seen a consistent message from the county um, that, that you could depend on and prove to be true in this whole situation. All right, John, your I, turn. I would argue in the other direction and say I think they've handled quite responsibly. Uh, no one knows what being attacked by ransomware is like unless they've been through it. And I've had it in my own business. I know what it's like when they seize your computers and you can't do a thing with them. Um, and you have, my business was attacked about five years ago, uh, one of the earlier attacks. Uh, and I had to pay a certain number of bitcoins at the time to have my computers released. But I went to every expert I could in town to get, to figure out how to get it done. Uh, and no one really had a good answer. And I had to trust that when I paid those bitcoins mm -hmm. that my computers were mm -hmm. going to be released. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they were. And maybe the same thing would have happened for the county, but maybe not. Uh, and if it happens once, will it happen a second or a third or a fourth time? I think it was very brave of them and important for them to go through the exercise of recovering their systems through their own backup systems. That's an exercise that every organization ought to be going through anyway. It's a fire drill, but it, but it will save them money in the long run, and their computers will be more secure as a result of it. I'll say this, props to them for having the backup systems to not that have. That they did to, have. To, yeah. to have. Exactly. Although so there's can. been some speculation on the completeness of, of sure. that compared to what they thought it was. But clearly it was enough to get them back to some sort of speed. And so that is, uh, the IT staff to be lost. So maybe a C instead of an F? No, my F, is, <laughs> it, my F is not for the IT staff, it's for the county leadership, which is, you know, too distinct. Well, I think I think I think to Nick's point, what he's really saying, if I mean, not that I'm putting words in your mouth, I guess I am. But you're right; they they, they did underplay it, and to say that this will be fixed in a week was yeah. stupid. Well, they underplayed I mean, it until they got called out on the scope. Then yeah. they said, "Oh, right, the scope's bigger." Then they said, "Oh, we're going to do this this way, and it'll yeah, be absolutely. faster." And now it's not bad. I mean, you just, this is the same kind of bad messaging and poor management that we saw from the county with the health department. But wait a minute, when you're in the middle of a crisis like that and you're still trying to assess how far reaching it is and how many departments mm -hmm. are involved mm -hmm. and you've got the media knocking on your door saying how long are we going to be shut down? Then just be honest. But be we honest may not say we know the answer well, but, well then say but we don't know. And also they started telling, putting definitive information out there before anyone asked. When they announced this attack they said here's the small scope, here's the small cost, they did that to themselves. They backed themselves into a corner, and so no, you don't get. Well, now let me ask you this: Was some of There's that messaging learned in these? Was things. some of that messaging maybe also for the hackers, so that the hacker did not feel they were empowered more greatly than? Well, the, the were? truth of the matter is, no, the hackers know. did not know Who that they had, had. They had, yeah, they had no county idea. government, yeah. a big fish on the line, no. until the county opened their mouth, and then all of a sudden the price started going that, up. That, but even and they still disputed that the price went up, even after we reported it, <laughs> it from a number up. of. People. Yes. But and to this day, we don't know who the hacker no, we was. Don't. No, we don't. It could be North don't. Korea with their and, systems and attacks. The, the, the interesting thing here is uh, that they decided not to pay it. Our station was attacked last year, and uh, by the same thing. And by the way, if you get an email that you don't recognize, don't open an attachment. Yeah. That's what that's, happened at our station. That's here. what happened at the county. Yes. And we actually went to the FBI, and the mm -hmm. FBI was like, just pay it. Mm -hmm. Just pay it. Now, the feds won't take that position publicly, but that's what they tell you, because there's no way for many organizations mm -hmm. to recover it. So the county, I, I, I will say, did a good job yeah. in getting their data recovered. But from a PR standpoint, I agree they botched it. Yeah. But I do also want to give a shout out to uh, members of the business community who I think also consulted with the county mm -hmm. and tried mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. lend them some expertise yep. on trying to. Well, Bank of America was quick well, to help. Uh, yeah, the, the, that, 
No. That was paid advice that they're getting from Fortalis Solutions. It's not they like are, yes, they all. They, oh, that yeah. group is a <laughs> yeah. consultant. Other plus IT other groups staff at Bank of America yeah. and yeah. other oh, okay. they did consult yeah. initially. Yeah. Neighbors help yeah. stepped okay. in to lend some free advice too. But obviously, we're touching on something that the county has to deal with, which is 2017 was a bumpy year for them. So right. now, and I've talked to some commissioners, they said we have to rebuild our reputation in the county because mm -hmm. you think about it from the health department to then their HIPAA situation where they release media, release sensitive information to the media That's by right, accident. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was a county thing. It wasn't the health department because mm -hmm. the county handles those FOIA requests. So the county has a lot of rebuilding to do. And this hack attack obviously wasn't the way they wanted to end 2017. And Dina DiOrio, I think, is on the hot seat in 2018. You know, the group that is, they've just released the committee assignments, uh, what, this week mm -hmm. uh, for commissioners this year. And the group that's on the evaluation committee that's going to do her job review this year is the group that's most vocally against her uh, most of the time or questions her more often than the other faction, if you will, in the county commission. So. I, I do want to add that it's important to call the FBI if you're ever attacked by ransomware. Uh, they are looking into these and they're trying to find the pattern. They're trying to find the actual hackers and they have a great deal more experience than they had five years ago when mm -hmm. I was attacked. Mm -hmm. Interesting news uh, this week from the Charlotte area transit system. Bus ridership has fallen in the last three years by 15 percent, and that's why CATS has started a new program to redesign the bus system. They want to incorporate more cross-town routes as opposed to funneling buses to the bus station in uptown Charlotte. Now, some say gentrification is a big reason for failing bus ridership. I want to read you this quote. It's from John Lewis, the CATS chief executive. He believes that gentrification is a big problem for the transit system because he says many uh, areas like Biddlefield and Smallville, or Smallwood rather, mm -hmm. um, are having more and more people move in building these fancy expensive homes and that's pushing a lot of the poorer folk to the extremely, uh, to the extremities of, of Charlotte's uh, city limits. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we have to wake up to the fact that the patterns of transportation in the city have changed now that the Beltway is completed mm -hmm. around the outside. The, the majority of the businesses are not focused in center city like they once were. Um, there are businesses forming all around the region I would hope that CATS is looking into a much larger mm -hmm. strategy. They certainly are with light rail going in different directions, up to Mooresville, out to the airport, down to Monroe. Um, that, those will all be important, but we ought to be gathering all the data we can and start looking at which way traffic is moving. Um, Pineville Matthews Road has become uh, really an in, impossible road to travel during rush hour because it's backed up in so many different directions. Well, I, the gentrification thing may sound nice. I think for the most part it's nonsense. Look, uh, I think one of the first stories I ever did when I came here to Channel 3 in 1978 was, why are people riding the city buses? And I know I did a ton of those stories in Durham before I came here. City bus lines have always done poorly here because people love cars. Uh, even people who may not be able to afford a great car would rather have a car than to ride the bus. So um, I think th the idea of a broader strategy is definitely needed and an idea to make bus ridership more attractive. And it seems like CATS and all of these bus lines that have been managed by the cities for years have not done a good job of trying to figure out really how to make it convenient. Yeah. And you have these uptown hubs that are nothing but crime magnets and people don't like having to funnel every trip they make uptown uh, and and risk getting mugged to, to transfer to another bus and that's a huge problem. Yeah, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to hang no. around the, the down, uptown bus station. I'll say this, we know in chart there's the growing divide between, you know, the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, if you're not economically stable, you could probably be helped by a ride to the bus, but if the bus doesn't come by where you live or yeah. get you to where you need to go, what good is it? So uh, good on cats for, for taking a hard look and trying to deliver a critical service to people who might actually need to use it. Well, we've got about three minutes to go. And before we go, I want to talk briefly about some of the stories that are sure to be in the headlines this year. Now, let's talk a little bit about Johnson C. Smith University. Back in December, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges put JSSU on probation for one year, um, primarily over the school's financial health. And they've just recently gotten a new president who now has to face a huge challenge of trying to deal with this, this situation. Um, that's clearly going to be a big story this year. Uh, Mecklenburg County Sheriff's race is going to be interesting to watch this year with uh, the incumbent Sheriff uh, Irwin Carmichael and Detective, uh, longtime CMPD Detective Gary McFadden, who has announced that he's going to throw his name in. So what are some of the other stories you're going to be watching this year? 
I, I think really that sheriff's race is really important because a lot of people forget that you elect the sheriff versus the police chief is someone that is, you know, hired and appointed. So this is a big deal. People in Mecklenburg County will be able to choose who is their next leader in this, you know, law enforcement role. So that is a big deal. So it'll be interesting to see how people vote, how people turn out, especially after last year. You know, in Charlotte, we had a big voter turnout rate, but even across the country, people came out in droves to vote in these smaller elections. So we'll see what happens in 2018. And, and Gary McFadden is an interesting character. He's a media star. That's right. You know, because he's on a reality Literally. television yeah. show about murder. And uh, so that's that, that'll be a fascinating race. But he watch. has he has done the work, though. He's very yeah. involved oh, behind the scenes. Yeah. So a lot of people see him as I am homicide, but he is actually someone who is very active in the community. So that is worth noting. He's done a lot of oh, stuff absolutely. that when the cameras aren't rolling, oh, he's still I doing agree. the work. Yeah. But, but a lot of people would, real say, deal, but a lot yeah. people would yeah. say that Orrin Carmichael has done a lot to bring st stability back to the department, especially after the departure of uh, former Sheriff Nick Mackey, right? Yes, but also a lot. He's faced some criticism on the 287G program, which is a federal program that allows some sheriff's deputies to act as ICE agents. And a lot of people in the immigrant community aren't happy about that. And that deals with the sheriff. You know, that's not county government. That's not city government. That's not even state government. The sheriff's office has that ability to be in that program. And actually, I think it was last year, they just re-upped their... I guess, partnership in that role. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to see how they take stances on that because that is something the immigrant community is very vocal about. Gentlemen, what are some of the other stories you'll be watching this year? Well, I'm going to watch the whole issue of upward mobility in Charlotte. Uh, we've certainly had lots of talk and lots of research, but not much action. Um, I don't know who's going to take the lead on this and make something happen, but uh, I, I think we're, we've made plenty of excuses. It's time to see what groups step forward with real funding. I don't expect them to come up with easy answers or for every every uh, 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 proposal they respond to to be successful, but they've got to start trying some things. And with that, you get the last word, John, because we're out of time. I'm sorry, Nick. Uh, that's all the time we have this week. Once again, I'd like to say thanks to our guests, uh, John Paul Gallus with CLT Biz, Nick Oxner with WBTB News 3, Mark Garrison with WBT Radio, and Kirsten Garris with Spectrum News. I'm Jeff Rivenbark. From all of us at PBS Charlotte, we're grateful for your support, and we hope you have a happy new year. of PBS Charlotte.